Hello, BookTube. Today, I want to talk about centuries. You know, those 100-year chunks of time that Western culture has decided to make meaningful. I think we do it partly because we want a way to understand ourselves, how we change, even though the truth is that change happens whenever it wants to, right? And I think that's why historians and all my English professors at the university would use terms like the long 18th century or the long 19th century. I mean, what they were wanting to do was discuss how change actually happened because those changes never start at the same time a new calendar century does. The book that I'm going to review today is nearly a century old, and it's going to talk about novels. And reading it stirred up a lot of thoughts in my mind about what things stand the test of time and what things just fade away. The book we're going to look at today is Aspects of the Novel by E.M. Forster, first published in 1927. Now, the Pelican edition that I got hold of actually came out in 1974. And of course, Pelican is an imprint of Penguin was. And Penguin, as you know, from so many videos that I've already put out, seems to be my favorite publisher. Question one, could I summarize this book? Aspects of the novel is the collected transcripts of the 1926 Clark Lectures. This lecture series has been held annually since 1888, and it is sponsored by Trinity College, Cambridge. The subject matter of the lectures must be about English literature, not before Chaucer. The lectures in this book dissect the English novel as an art form, as it was anyway, in 1926. And because Forster is the person doing this dissecting work, it isn't clinical or, and it isn't an unsettling experience. Uh, Forster has a way, that's the best I can put it. His editor, Oliver Staleybrass, admitted that the organization of Forster's thinking might seem a little bit ramshackly, a little bit here and there, but his lectures were a great success because he had this knack for connecting with the sensibilities of the common reader. Question two, what is known about the author? Well, back in 2019, I was browsing in our local library and I discovered Wendy Moffat's biography of E.M. Forster titled A New Life. And I recommend that very highly if you want a fuller story than I give you today. Edward Morgan Forster known as Morgan, was born in 1879. His father died when he was only three, but there was enough money in the will so that Morgan and his mother were able to live comfortably. Morgan studied at King's College, Cambridge, which is the buildings you see in the photograph below, that's King's College Chapel and the Hall. And it was one of his professors who encouraged Forster to consider writing as a career. During his postgraduate travels in Italy, Forster gathered notes, which became the basis for his first novel, A Room with a View, which was published in 1908. Between then and 1924, he published a further five novels, but he did not produce any fiction after that. In a 1959 interview he gave to the BBC, Forster said, I think one of the reasons why I stopped writing novels is that the social aspect of the world changed so very much. I'd been accustomed to write about the old, vanished world with its homes and its family life and its comparative peace. All of that went. And though I can think about it, I cannot put it into fiction form. 1959 was the year Forster was granted an honorary fellowship by King's College, Cambridge, and he based himself at the college until his death in 1970. A year following his death, a manuscript titled Morris, which Morgan wrote between 1910 and 1913, but shared only with trusted friends, was finally published. Morris made public Forster's homosexuality and portrayed the difficulty all gay men faced having to negotiate a way to live and love with the real threat of social rejection and, until the United Kingdom passed new legislation in 1967, also criminal conviction. Question three, how is this book structured? Well, the Clark Lectures give the book its structure. Each chapter is one lecture discussing different attributes of book-length fiction, story, the people. In fact, there are two lectures about the people, plot, and then there are elements which Forster chooses to call fantasy, 
prophecy, pattern, and rhythm. These chapters are topped and tailed with an introduction and a conclusion by Forrester. There's also a second introduction by the editor, Oliver Staleybrass, who helped Forrester uh, put together a number of his other books. And at the back of my 1974 edition, there are also some interesting appendices. You can see a sample of Forrester's preparation notes. There's a couple of essays that had been published or broadcast post 1926, where Forrester talks about similar topics, and there's also an annotated subject index. The paperback version I had was 204 pages long, and of that, 187 pages were the text. Question five, how did I get this book and how much did it cost? I bought this book secondhand during the trip to Heian Wai, which some of you may remember from my Gore Vidal video very early on. I made it just just after I started the channel, if you want to go back and check. I did not make a note of which bookshop I got the book from. Sorry, I'm normally very fastidious about that. But I did pay £3.95. Now, what's interesting is that 1974 version, a new copy of that book would have cost me £1.50 back then. But £1.50 in 1974 is the equivalent of £20 today. Question six, have I encountered anything unexpected or interesting? <laughs> Where do I start? Forrester begins his lectures by completely taking apart our usual way, or no, wait a minute, my usual way of seeing fiction writers. This is the problem with taking an English literature degree, because English literature, really, the courses are actually, it's actually a history degree, but you're just focusing on the book bits. <laughs> <laughs> if that makes sense. But the result is that you always think of famous writers as points on a timeline, and you mainly compare them to their contemporaries, mainly. And you talk about concepts like realism and modernism because they happen at particular junctures of time. What Forrester does is something really radical. He tears all the writers out of their historical context, and he asks you to pretend that they're all sitting in one room at the same time working on their novels together. And then what he does is he takes you on this imaginary tour of the room and you start comparing writers that you might not have thought to put together. Let's say Lawrence Stern and Virginia Woolf, or Samuel Richardson with Henry James, or Charles Dickens with H.G. Wells. The passages that Forrester chooses to put side by side, what they demonstrate is that time has made less of a difference to the business of creating a novel than we might think. Andy takes a close look at the two pillars of prose fiction, character and story stroke plot. I put story and plot together, okay? Forrester deals with them separately and he explains why, but to be honest, I've never understood why from the viewpoint of a reader or a writer, why you would separate them. Forrester does explain. He describes story as just, just the event sequence, you know, as if a storyteller would sit down and say to you, okay, this happened, and then this happened, and then this happened, and then this happened. And a good storyteller can use cliffhangers to pique our curiosity. But see, Fisher makes this very important point on page 87. He says, quote, curiosity is one of the lowest of human faculties. So he felt that most readers would want a book that appealed to more. They would want to have appeals made to their intelligence and their memory. In other words, they would want the writer to make a very careful arrangement of those story pieces and give them information in a particular way so that the novel needs the reader to operate almost with a split mind. That is to say, half of your mind is taking in what you're actually reading now, and the other half is considering what you have already read in the light of what you see coming. And that, that ability to split the reader's mind is what Forrester considers the ability to really plot a novel well. And I see now why I never understood the point of separating story from plot. I think my personal bottom line for a decent book is that the two things have to be together. Forrester's final lectures seem to focus on defining the more elusive qualities that make a novel stand out from other novels. And for those, it might be good to bear in mind my answer to the next question, right? Question seven, is there anything readers should bear in mind <laughs> to be prepared, you know, if they're gonna go ahead and buy this book? Forrester may have a knack for presenting ideas, but you might find that he'll set out on a particular line of thought and you just find you don't make sense out of it. 
And I want to put it out there that I didn't get everything that Forrester said first time. He uses certain novels as his teaching aids. He's reviewing their characters and their, their plotting in detail. <sighs> and those passages, they're less helpful if you haven't read the novel in question. So I think this is a book that you would buy and hang on to because the points that I did understand were they were brilliant. And so I think what you should do is every time you finish one of the novels that Forrester uses to explain a concept, that's when you go back to his lectures, look up the title of the book in the subject index and revisit what he says to see if now you have a clear sense of what he's trying to say. Then I think his strange knack for conveying ideas will get through to you. No problem. Question eight. Is there anything else interesting to know? about this book. Well, it was very interesting to consider how time has its effect on fiction since Forrester gave those lectures. One of the writers he mentioned very often, actually, is George Meredith. When he first dropped that name on page 62, I remember I said out loud, who? And I had to Google the name. None of George Meredith's novel titles rang a bell. His greatest claim to fame, according to the internet, is that he wrote the poem which inspired the composer Rafe Vaughan Williams to create The Lark Ascending. Apparently, though, Meredith's star was dimming even in Forster's day. On page 89 of the book, Forster says, quote, Meredith is not the great name he was 20 or 30 years ago, when much of the universe and all Cambridge trembled. <laughs> oh, it sounds like Percy Shelley's Ozymandias, doesn't it? The once great writer who's now virtually unknown. It's an important thing to bear in mind, though. Being a best-selling writer is no guarantee of literary immortality. Oh, and James Joyce. Oh, my. <laughs> so it's, it's amusing, actually, how Forrester dismisses Ulysses in two short sentences. He says, does it come off? Mm, no, not quite. <laughs> <laughs> That's on page 114. Little did Forrester know, and I did not realize this, that Ulysses was published in Paris in 1922, but it was not available in England until 1936. There was a version of Ulysses that appeared in the United States, but it came out without Joyce's permission. And so you didn't get an accurate copy of Ulysses in America until 1934. And lastly, Forrester has a chapter titled Fantasy. But if you're a fantasy reader, don't expect discussion about the genre. When Forrester was giving these lectures, a young Tolkien was just starting his teaching appointment at Oxford. Mervyn Peake was only 15. And Brian Aldiss was wearing diapers. <laughs> of course, there were fantastic novelists like H. Ryder Haggard and Edgar Rice Burroughs, but you can tell from the way Forrester is using the term fantasy that there was no concept of the genre. He's using the word in a different way altogether. Question eight. Any ideas for related or follow-up reading with an appropriate photo of the haunted bookshop in Cambridge? Well, Forrester did a vast amount of reading just to prepare for those lectures. From the indications I get from Oliver Staley Brass's introduction, he was working for a year on his material. You could do worse than I did. I underlined every book title Forrester mentioned in his lectures. That would make a perfectly respectable TBR list if you're the kind of person who likes to make TBR lists. For myself, I was interested in Forrester's descriptions about what made Walter Scott such a a best-selling author in his day, because he was a contemporary of Jane Austen. And yet, I think if we, we could say fairly today, Sir Walter Scott does not sit on the same level as Jane Austen, but he outsold her back in the day. So I've got a paperback copy of Ivanhoe, and maybe I'm going to schedule that somehow into my reading and see if I then can go back to Forrester's lectures and see what he was saying about Scott's writing and, and why it was so popular when it was popular. Now, the Clark Lectures are still given annually. More recent ones are available as podcasts or videos. So in the description box, I'm going to give you a link to the Cambridge University website. Also, older lectures are in print. So it's worth visiting the website and looking for a subject that appeals and then checking to see if there's a print version on Amazon or some other bookseller. And that's it, everybody. Right, what can you look forward to next? Well, look out for another Middlemarch Meditations later on in the week. I need to buy myself a little more time to finish my Northanger Abbey double read that I've been talking about, you know, where I, I'm looking at Jane Austen's classic novel alongside Val McDermott's contemporary take on the characters and the events. So look out for that. Thanks very much for listening, and I look forward to seeing you very soon. Take care. Bye-bye.